So that is why with stress management, the number one thing is whatever I've observed during COVID times, because the stress has been very sustained. It has been unprecedented. We've had very few protocols to fall back on, on how to cope with this kind of stress. First thing is acknowledging the stress. You have to acknowledge because I still see people around me who are visibly very stressed, but they live in denial. So you cannot address something that you deny. Number one, there is no shame in admitting that you are stressed. And the faster you ask and seek help, the better you will be able to come out of it and the less damage you will do to yourself physically, mentally and emotionally. The second thing is that once you have admitted that you have stress, you also need to put it in perspective. A little bit of stress we all experience every day. Positive stress is in fact good. If you were totally devoid of stress, we wouldn't be human beings. Hey listeners, welcome back to Inspire Someone today. Today's guest is a wellness entrepreneur and a coach who dons multiple hats. She is Vani Pawa, a seasoned and recognized Indian classical dancer. She has acquired an inherent knowledge of the importance of holistic wellness and functional fitness from a very young age. With over two decades of experience in wellness and functional fitness, Vani strongly believes that one should train for life and not for events. Join me in this very intriguing conversation of celebrating moment. Hello listeners. With me today is a versatile and vivacious personality. She is also one of the foremost moment specialist in India. It's my honor and pleasure to have Vani joining us on Inspire Someone today. Vani, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Srikant, for such a tall introduction. It is absolutely my pleasure and honor to be here and to share the conversation with you. Wonderful. So, Vani, you are somebody who is a proponent of what is called a celebrate moment. Yes. And we'll kickstart our conversations talking about this whole moment called a celebrate moment. So, tell us a bit about it and how can one enhance the quality of life by virtue of adapting this virtue called a celebrate moment. So uh, you got it absolutely right. I'm somebody who really celebrates movement. I, in fact, in some ways even worship movement because to me, movement is two very fundamental things. Number one, it is indicative of life. It is the essence of life. And number two, movement is what keeps the flow going in life. So movement is, I'm not uh, very fond of people restricting movement in pure physical terms, like when the uh, interpretation is purely based on exercise or activity. There is movement in everything that we do. And if you consider it, when I said movement is life, at the very basic level, breath, as long as the human being has the breath flowing in them, that is movement. That is movement of life. When breath stops, life stops. There are many spiritual and other uh, discussions and this can be interpreted differently. But at a very basic level, yes, movement is what keeps us going. And also I have seen that when movement at any plane, whether it is physical, whether it is emotional, you know, our emotions, they also need to move and flow through us. They need to uh, be produced in us. We need to experience them. They need to live a life cycle and we need to allow them to flow out. So there is movement there as well. So my whole concept of movement is very interrelated. I don't try to make any academic distinctions between that. If you just celebrate movement, it is indicative of life. It is a celebration of life. So when you look at it, when you embrace it, when you enjoy it that way, it becomes a fairly... Um, intuitive process of incorporating movement in all that you do and do it in a manner that it frees up all blockages, physical, mental, emotional, mm -hmm. spiritual. And why do you think it's very critical for anybody to follow movement in their day-to-day -day life? Okay, so I would want to share certain personal examples here from my own life, uh, you know, because uh, I come from a family and unfortunately we do have certain serious illnesses which have befallen certain members of my family. And the prime example for me, in fact, what got me thinking this way was my mother. Now, my mother was a patient of multiple sclerosis, which is a movement debilitating condition. 
And hers was an extremely rare case where it was not just the lower body, but her complete body was paralyzed, including her vocal cords. And I saw a very bright, vibrant, active woman who was bedridden for 14 years with a fully active mind, but a body which refused to move. There was no part of the body that moved. How she coped with it, in fact, doctors used to always say, you know, we tried all kinds of experimental treatments at that point of time because there was very little understanding about this condition. She basically survived, I think, by willpower, you know, by wanting to be there around to whatever capacity she was there for her children. Then a couple of years down the line, my own experiences. I've, I've been a dancer since a very, very young age. I started dancing when I was not even five years old. So that's about 35, 40 years of history, uh, you know, with the Indian classical art form, which is a very holistic system. It has the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, everything. Then I had a couple of freak accidents where gradually movement started getting taken away from my plate. And firsthand, I witnessed what it did to me, what it did to my personality, what it did to my peace of mind. Here was something that I celebrated and I was increasingly being told that this may not be possible. And I instinctively fought to get movement back in my life and which incidentally also formed the genesis of my journey into a very academic kind of a pursuit of understanding the anatomy. And it was a very simple mindset. If I cannot do this, if my body is giving me a challenge here, I need to think of something else that is going to bypass this particular problem and still allow me to move. And the opening up, the blocking and the opening up of all my channels, particularly my emotional channels, and somewhere linked to that was also spiritual channels. Uh, you know, pain is not something nice that you want to live with. Pain comes when there are restrictions in the body and when there are restrictions in the mind, like I said. So when I, as over the years, my whole pursuit has been in overcoming whatever challenges are coming there, and as and how I am moving more freely, I am becoming a freer person. And this is what somehow resonates with my clients as well, whether, whether they're medical fitness clients or whether they're general fitness clients. So movement, like I said, and you know, if you were to take a parallel from nature, you tell me now, Shrikant, what is it about the outdoors that really appeals to you? Why do we find the outdoors so soothing? Even if you are not moving, if you're sitting by the side of a stream, you hear the gurgling of water. Sometimes you may not even right. see the water body, but the sound is evocative of movement. The sound indicates that there is movement of water somewhere. You hear the rustling of the leaves. You see the leaves and you see the flowers flowing in the wind. That does something for you. That opens you up. Isn't it? And that's why we also try and say, even our ancient texts say that it's good to take your exercising outdoors because you imbibe so much of this extra movement happening in nature around you, which spurs you to overcome your own inertia, whether that inertia is physical, mental, emotional, whatever. And it gets you going. So for all these reasons and purely from personal example, and I see because I deal with people who have movement debilitating conditions. Parkinson, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, etc. You know, when you become movement deficient, you also by corollary become little dependent upon caregivers. That can play havoc with your sense of self-respect. That can play havoc with your sense of self-control. And that can set a very negative spiral. People, why do we say that some people give up uh, mentally even before the disease has completely overtaken them? So it's movement. You basically want to look for a solution where you can move past these blockages and move. It is absolutely essential for everybody, even for mental health conditions. Uh, when we say wellness, we always try to push for the physical aspect as well, isn't it? We also say that right. exercise will be a facilitator for your mental health as well. So it is the underlying tenet of movement in exercise. It doesn't really matter what your modality is. What is the tool with which you exercise? The fact that it allows your body, it allows your blood, it allows your cells to move inside you, and it yields psychological, physical, physiological benefits. So it is absolutely essential. A great perspective there, Vani. I think movement is just not physical. It's all encompassing. 
and if somebody were to kind of incorporate this in their everyday routine what are the small little things that one can look into and incorporate movement into the day to day affairs of an individual so i'd like to answer this in two parts uh, you know one you said is what will it do when you incorporate it before you even answer that question what i am realizing that many people get stuck up with it is how to incorporate movement and there again it is a question of perception so if you limit the concept and thought and approach towards movement as physical exercise chances are that you will hit you do those 10000 steps in a day or you will do that half an hour 30 40 50 minutes 60 minutes of a workout right that is fabulous movement but what i am referring to as incorporating it is little going throughout the day so certainly you have this surge of intense definite activity that you've done as part of an exercise but then the rest of the day counts as well because your body continues to function through the rest of the day the demands on the body and the demands on the mind continue for the hours that you are awake and in fact sometimes even when you're asleep so look at movement if you want if you are a seasoned exerciser you get that dedicated activity out of the way but for the rest of the hours that you have not purely exercising you need to get up and move uh, particularly if you're feeling tired if you're feeling stressed about something why do we often tell people why don't you go and take a walk it might just help sort things out for you why is, why do sometimes people think that i had a eureka moment or i had a breakthrough moment when i went for a walk or i went for a run it's basically again interpreting movement the way i did it doing it in little bits throughout the day is the trick every opportunity every reminder that you get in your mind and in your brain that i can get up and move just do it and yes if you want to enjoy movement like a dancer um, a dance is something so exhilarating again it ties in so beautifully everything just flows mm-hmm. from inside you pick and choose how you want to move just get up and walk if nothing else go stand outside look at the trees uh, swaying outside take a stroll come back and continue with your work doesn't have to be always uh, structured in nature doesn't have to be restricted to that so let us get keep the focus every reminder act on that reminder so make it small keep reminders act on those reminders that's the mantra there you know the body reminds that's a beautiful thing about the body it's the most complex piece of machinery it is also the most intelligent piece of being on earth the organism the human being as an organism is a very complex one there's a reason why we are capable of so much the body is constantly giving you signs the mind is constantly giving you appeals of movement move move you just need to tune in a little bit better catch the frequency you're tuned into so much you're tuned into radio frequencies on the radio um, netflix frequencies you're tuned into everything how about just tuning into your own frequency you know keep that frequency going throughout doesn't matter sometimes there are cross currents pick one frequency and just get going with it talking about tuning into frequency i think you also mentioned very highly about something called as flow that the importance of flow and its impact on relationships yes talk us a bit about that so i think in some ways my previous answers already laid the groundwork for flow flow and movement as being synonymous but to get it back again into perspective life is flow when we say you know you flow with life in fact that is very often the aspiration even in our spiritual seekings isn't it we are just feeling stuck we are feeling boxed we have, we feel that the flow within us in our lives in our thought process in our emotions has stopped and this incidentally has a huge bearing on physical movement as well because like i said it's a very complex piece of machinery so what you experience think and feel can also negatively impact your muscles in a very very physical perceptible empirical sense why do you think stressed people manifest physical illness more than people who are experiencing the flow within themselves muscles jam up when muscles start jamming up circulation gets blocked so these two are actually interlinked at a very basic level and interlinked at a very complex level as well so flow you have to be tuned in to are you experiencing any blockage anywhere if it is physical aches and pains that you're happening at the most basic level chances are you are not moving your body enough 
there's a reason why God gave you two arms and two legs. Your two limbs move. A tree is stuck to the ground on a trunk and even there constantly sways throughout the day. So what is our excuse as a human being that we choose to be like dead wood? Why do we make ourselves dead wood? We have such powerful branches that allow us to do so much in life. We can lift weights, we can reach out, we pick and hug our loved ones. We are actually using our extremities, isn't it? So facilitate that, nurture that. And of course, coming back to the exercise paradigm, you become stronger. The more you use it, the human body is a simple case of use it or lose it. You've been given very well working piece of machinery. Don't work hard to make it work suboptimally. So just flow, just flow with it. Don't think of life's actions, whether they are physical or mental, as different compartments. And that is why I am not a big votary of addressing in the name of wellness sometimes, which is what I happen to perceive as mental wellness is being addressed in isolation to physical wellness. I don't think so because the holistic whole approach of holism is that it's like a Venn diagram. They have points of intersection. You need to be working on both simultaneously. There needs to be a point of dialogue between these aspects of your life. That is where flow comes in. If you just jump around and sit down, you float for that bit. No, it does. And you also touched upon elements, which is very critical in the times that we are, which is about stress management, right? When you feel that the muscles are jammed, when you feel that there are certain aches that is happening in the body, that's a sure short signs that you've got to do something about it, be it movement, be it flow, whatever you want to call it as. So what is your remedy to kind of manage stress, particularly in the times that we are in? And what are some of the easiest tips or tricks somebody can follow to overcome this challenge? Let me answer this question by first leading with a question that when you experience stress, what do you observe happens to your breathing pattern? It becomes shallow. It becomes shallow. And sometimes the more stressed you are, and if it is a very sudden and a very intense surge of stress or an external threat perception that has happened, you may even hold your breath for some time. And if you go back, what is breath? Breath is like force. Breath is not just keeping you alive. Breath is also oxygenating all your cells. It is ensuring that everything at a cellular level is firing well. Your cells also need that fuel and this fuel comes from the oxygen that you're blowing in. When you're stressed and when your breathing stops or when your breathing is shallow or restricted, there is a very perceptible drop in physical performance and because muscles, joints, your neurological system depends on this fuel which it stops getting. It's like nutrition. So the nutrition gets compromised. So naturally the physical functioning gets jammed. And when the physical functioning gets jammed, that becomes a magnet for any kind of a disease or an illness or an ache and pain at the best to happen. So that is why with stress management, the number one thing is Whatever I've observed during COVID times, because the stress has been very sustained, it has been unprecedented. We've had very few protocols to fall back on, on how to cope with this kind of stress. First thing is acknowledging the stress. You have to acknowledge because I still see people around me who are visibly very stressed, but they live in denial. So you cannot address something that you deny, number one. There is no shame in admitting that you are stressed. And the faster you ask and seek help, the better you will be able to come out of it and the less damage you will do to yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally. The second thing is that once you have admitted that you have stress, you also need to put it in perspective. A little bit of stress we all experience every day. Positive stress is, in fact, good. If you were totally devoid of stress, we wouldn't be human beings. We need something to also spur us on to take the next step in our life. So, positive stress is good. Do not attach so much importance to every stress that you feel in your life as your mental health getting challenged. That perspective is something also we, that we need to do, uh, mainly because the conversation along that dialogue is high volume and high frequency these days. There is so much being spoken. The tendency to ascribe a mental illness upon yourself can be as real as being in denial of it. So get that perspective going. Is it something that you're experiencing for the time being? Sure, it's a little bit more than normal. Accept it. It will settle. Third is you need to figure out a practice 
it's like you cannot say that I want a muscular, strong or a toned body just by looking or thinking or wishing upon it. You need to get up and do. You need to figure out what is the physical routine that works for you and you need to keep changing it over a period of time. Isn't it what we call the principle of periodization? Your body starts adapting to whatever you're doing very fast. So you need to shake it up, you need to break it up and you need to subject it to something new and different to start getting results. It's the same thing with your uh, mental uh, stress and your mental wellness as well. There are many practices to each his own. Now, chanting may work for me. It may not work for you. Some kind of a meditative technique may work for you. It may not work for me or for the person next to me. So movement. For me, movement is very meditative. Chanting works, meditation works. But my first line of defense is always movement because my body automatically tells me, get up, walk, move, sort yourself out a little bit. And when I'm moving, I'm able to start, you know, collating in my head. Shall I try chanting? Shall I try this? Shall I try that? Shall I speak to a counselor? Shall I speak to somebody whom I love? Shall I speak to an outsider? So you need to do this little bit of homework for yourself. Please don't go by what works for anybody else. Whatever resonates with you and you'll be able to tell the results fairly instantly. Something that makes you feel a little relaxed and light and something that makes you feel that I feel so much better after having tried this than before. That is something for you to do. Once you become good at it, adept at it, and you still feel the need to go a step further, go on to the next modality. Mix and match is what you need to do. So treat it like that. The first is, of course, being aware. The second is making a decision to do something with that awareness. And the third is action upon that awareness. And the fourth is realizing that it is a process. Everything in life is a process. Physical fitness, mental fitness, emotional fitness, stress management. So when you give yourself that much of leeway and a timeline that I will take time to come out of this, I will take time to even figure out if what I'm doing is working for me or not, you're not adding additional stress. So no unrealistic expectations, no miraculous expectations. It's just a process respected. You, you didn't suddenly become 50 years old. You took 50 years to become 50 years old. You're now a byproduct of experiences, isn't it? Every experience came at its own time cycle. And you dealt with perhaps even if the same experience repeating itself, your response might be maturing or your response might be changing because of all the accumulated previous experiences and responses. It's a process. It's the same way. So look for your little banks in this, in these choppy waters. Wherever you get that little bank, stand, rest a while, then hit the waters again. One, you have been a forefront fitness uh, movement specialist, fitness specialist for thousands of people, both nationally as well as internationally. From your own experience, what are the key observations that you have seen interacting with these thousands of people? And what are some of the recommendations that you feel that these are the things that we should avoid, come what may? Okay, that's like summing up so many different experiences that I've had and I keep having with uh, the people around me. But pretty much related to all that I've been talking about, the number one observation that I find which lies at the crux of no matter whatever physical condition or um, problem that a person comes to me with it is, either there is a genuine lack of awareness or there is awareness but a lack of respect for what the human body is capable of doing and being. There's a lot of taking it for granted because there is just so much gyan out there. There is so much science out there. You really, even if you shut your eyes, there is no way that you will not be privy to the kind of information that we have about the human body. But to internalize the fact that I have been given a piece of equipment, but I'm not using it or I'm choosing to just park it in the garage. There is a little bit of resistance I see in people there could be coming from anywhere. It could be coming from a sense of fear, uncertainty, or downright stubbornness. I have seen that as well too. I have seen grown-up people behaving like stubborn children. I am like this only. Now, to me, that is not a very grown-up or a very mature way of presenting anything. Less of all, presenting yourself to yourself. The number two is people 
sometimes do not do this exercise, foundational exercise of deciding why am I doing or not doing something. So, for example, if somebody comes to me, I want to uh, take part in this particular event. I want to get trained for this or I, and I need to get a rehab for this. My first question is, why? Where is this goal setting coming from? Forget about rehab. Rehab is a different subset. I'll touch that later. If you are otherwise a healthy individual, where is your goal coming from? Is it your own goal or is it a borrowed goal? Are you assuming that this is your goal because of the influences of all that is happening around you? Chances are you will fall off that goal because it was never yours to begin with, right? Or you've achieved one goal and that's the end of it. Whereas movement, like I said, is a process. It's a spectrum. You need to keep moving. You need to keep progressing and becoming better and better. Only when you're aligned to the fact that Okay, I want to do this. I want to achieve this. I want to be able to perform this because I feel this is where I am and this is where I want to be. And these are my limitations and this is what's going to open up. for me. It's like you do that kind of a SWOT analysis at work, isn't it? When you do a goal setting for your corporate or when you do a goal setting for your business or industry, you do the figures and then you work backwards. You don't just suddenly come up and say, I have an aspiration or a breakthrough goal. I want to do a hundred thousand crore of turnover. All right, great, you want to do it. Why do you want to do 100,000 turnover? And if you want to do that, what do you want to do to get there? It's the same thing. It's just the same thing about your own physical fitness. It's not rocket science. And at the same time, let's not dump it down and let's not push it under the carpet as a very low priority item. The other reason why people very often hit physical fitness, which is related to all of these factors, is only when life or their own body forces them to address fitness. For example, illness. For example, injury. Now, most of the injuries can be due to very common reasons of overuse and overcompensation. You don't move otherwise and you move or stretch in a certain manner. Your muscles are not prepped up. Your joints, you've not been lubricating them enough. You've not been preparing the body enough. Even a normal activity in a day can leave you injured. Likewise, if you're an athlete, and you have been overstretching and you have not been following the process. Of course, the genuine accidents can happen. But usually I have seen it is when people are either overshooting or when people are not doing the requisite amount of release work also with their body. If the body needs action and it needs a little bit of release work in terms of de-stressing of your muscle, the rest, what we call cool the down. rest. Cool down, yes, but the rest periods in between. People somehow don't have this balance. So there is a lack of balance in the thought process. The balance is something that I find myself driving very hugely. I always joke, you know, I was asked about this question in a lot of forums and I suddenly realized that this answer applies to me. They said, how would I define my role in the fitness industry? I said, I'm the brake and the clutch. And they didn't understand. I said, because we have too many people who've got their foot on the accelerator all the time. And we have too many drivers teaching how to drive at high speed. Push, push, go beyond your capacity, which is essential. Don't get me wrong. But where is the braking happening? Where is the changing of the gears happening? You go at different speeds and different gears, don't you? Even if it is an automatic car, it has a gear in, a gear system inside it. So by virtue of the kind of people who've been coming to me, I have become more of a, a brake and a gear Breaking. for people to tell them, this is the time for you to break. This is the time for you to shift gears. And lastly, I would say is um, a little bit of inertia and a little bit of laziness. So even those who get um, physically active, it requires a little bit of a push and a creativity to go on changing what you are doing. So if you're always running, running all the time, if you're always doing strength training all the time or any one modality you're doing, it becomes a law of diminishing returns over a period of time because your body has got used to it. You're no longer getting the results. But because it's become very comfortable for you, nothing changes if nothing changes. Even with our work, we need to aspire and we need to aim a little differently and try different things. It's just the same with physical workout. So this, uh, you know, and yes, I cannot end without saying this at the probably the risk of offending some of the listeners here. What I grossly find lacking Shrikant and increasingly so is good old common sense. Common sense. I don't know why people have stopped thinking. Why have you stopped thinking and assessing things for yourself? 
particularly when it comes to fitness routines and the kind of questions that come my way. I don't expect them coming from intelligent human beings. And by intelligent, I don't mean academic gurus. I just mean anybody who has managed to survive for as long as they have managed to survive. It's common sense. So I, I get questions, uh, you know, give me a shortcut to uh, losing weight, but I don't want to diet. I don't want to exercise. I don't want to do this. And I said, you're coming from such a scarcity mindset. Don't, 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 don't. Then don't do anything. Play it by the year. See where your body takes you. Enjoy as long as it takes you where it takes you. When it collapses, please know you only you and that lack of common sense is responsible. How can an adult be asking me, I want to get all the results without doing anything? If you're lucky, you'll get it. Luck by chance. Instant gratification. Instant gratification and common sense are also because these days the pace of social media is so aggressive. You know, social media definitely has its benefits, but if you are not careful about striking balance, you need to see about what works for you. What is the influence that you're doing? Don't be blindly following trends. And the blind following of trends is another thing which I notice a lot, a lot. This syndrome of this is the best, this is the most international, this is the latest. It may be so, but is it the best for you is my question. So how does one validate it? So, Vandi, there is so much of things going around us, right? How does one validate and take those kind of measured decisions? So, like with anything else, you see, if you already have an experience of doing something, you have a little bit of knowledge and experience on your side to try something and be able to judge whether this is the next step or whether this is the wrong step for you or whether this is something that is going to keep you plateauing in that, right? You always have the option of seeking out and reaching to experts and to coaches who are trained to guide you there. Number two, if you're a complete novice, like with work, what should you do if you're a complete novice? Will you just jump into a business? Will you just jump into doing something? You go around, you ask questions from people who are already doing it, isn't it? You try to get some inputs and then see and make an intelligent decision for yourself. So if you're a complete novice, definitely ask the people around you who have that lifestyle that you are aspiring to have and ask them what works for you. Do you have any recommendations for me? And in both the cases, in both the cases, like you have a life coach, financial coach, business coach, you have wellness coaches who are trained and who have the experience to guide you as per where you are on the spectrum right now. Seek them. You like something? Sure, by all means. By all means. But if you're not sure, better sorry than never. You know, I mean, ask somebody, ask a coach or reach out to somebody who's doing it and say, hey, listen, this is uh, this is what I do or this is what I don't do. You think I'll be safely be able to attempt it? So, Vani, if I were to ask you if there's a billboard message put out there and if Vani were to share a message or a quote on that billboard message, what would that be? You know, uh, somebody said that it seems to be very movement centric. I will say that movement of body and stillness of mind, that might be a better way of putting it. And the retention is more than the drive and the motivation is more. So, Varni, before we sign off, one thing that was very much on my mind to ask you was, you had had such an illustrious career. You have played various roles. You're still a practicing uh, dancer. You are an IT professional, an entrepreneur, journalist, and now a moment expert. If you can summarize the big takeaways from all of these transitions. So, uh, Shrikant, I was uh, started my career with IT years ago, and I was never a journalist. I'm a columnist, so I do write for newspapers and magazines, but it's not a journalism profession that I have. And each one literally flowed into the other. And these were also synonymous with certain occurrences and uh, developments in my own personal life. I was dancing, I told you, from a very, very young age. And of course, along with that, my IT work, I was one of the country's first internet um, uh, solutionists, you know, programmer. I was, I started with that. And then I met uh, with two nasty freak accidents and I needed spine rehab. And that's when I needed to push with my movement, the long hours of sitting, just dancing and then sitting at my desk for long hours wasn't solving, cutting it for me. And that's how I started getting into the study of the anatomy. It was more to find solutions for myself. 
to become a fitness trainer or a wellness specialist was never on the agenda. It's just that somehow what happened was that very organic, actually. Everything has been organic. But the only thing that I did decide to do was the IT. I did my certifications because that was my dream job at that point of time. And I said, I want to become a programmer. So that was the first and the only thing that really happened to me with a very conscious decision. Then the accidents happened mm -hmm. and then my own process of overcoming my limitations. And while I was doing that, I happened to read a board somewhere said Reebok Certified Trainer. This was years ago. And I said, all right, let's go and try this. And by nature, by nature, I like to delve a little bit deeper into things. I do not usually take things at face value. So if somebody tells me, do this, the kind of person I am, I will do my homework and study and decide, you know, does it work for me or not? I landed up doing that certification. That was just to keep me going and active with everything. And as luck would have it, few people whom I met along this journey said, would you like to train us now that you're certified as well? I said, okay, I never considered myself a trainer at that point of time. I said, sure, I'll help you to whatever extent it can. And literally, that is how I began my journey because it started getting deeper and deeper. As my clients started realizing that I'm not just coming from an academic field, but I've also been there, done that with certain debilitating challenges and I've overcome them, it somehow just gave them confidence in me and it resonated. And as more complicated cases started coming, I started reading, studying more and then certifying more. And that is how I landed up becoming a rehab professional. And that is how I landed up becoming one of the country's first uh, medical fitness uh, professionals as well. And now today I'm dealing with people who have cancer, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson. I'm one of the country's first cancer exercise specialists. And like I said, honesty, you know, when you're dealing with somebody who has such a grave health condition, I have to know as much as I can. It's incumbent. It's my responsibility. That is my honest approach. I'm not going to jump into it and offer you advice, solicited or otherwise. If I genuinely don't know at least the basics of what you're asking. Of. That's how it just started. And dancing continues through it all. It is my soul food. It really keeps me sorted. It does not get in the way of things. It completely embellishes. It's the Guru Shishya Parampara. It's the most holistic system of wellness. A lot of those learnings came intrinsically. I imbibe them without doing any kind of theoretical research then. It's only now as I'm getting more, uh, as I become an exponent of this and that, and I need to talk about it and convince people about it, I'm some, sometimes surprised. Where is this coming from? And I realize my dancing. Mohini Atam is the style that I do. It's a beautiful style. Uh, that's one style you cannot cheat with. If you ever watch a performance of Mohini Atam and our style of Mohini Atam, you'll know body needs to close. So if the mind is blocked, your attention is blocked. Your body shows it. The movement gets blocked. So it's beautiful. It's my go-to. Uh, you know, I seek it for answers and I go there just to lose myself as well. So everything has for me come naturally. I think part of it was destiny. I only did the first kickstart of the scooter after that, where the scooter turned into a bike and where the bike turned into a car. <laughs> I wouldn't put it as a very conscious decision there. So you went to the flow. I went with the flow. <laughs> I was desisting from saying that lest I sound repetitive, but you said it. Wonderful. And Vani, this show is all about creating those ripples of inspiration. What is your inspire someone message? Uh, you know, for that, I would really say cliched as it may sound, accept yourself. You have, when I say look within, I don't mean that you really need to do that much of a spiritual practice and some kind of a discourse. You just need to accept yourself. And when I say accept yourself, it'll have to be a very brutal looking at yourself. What is it that is making you unhappy? And why is it that you're still unhappy and not doing something about it? And what is it that you need to do to move out of that state of unhappiness or stress or a blockage? So the answer truly lies within you. I definitely believe that. I've lived by it. I've seen people around me. My, my inspirations and going back right to my mother. She found the strength from within. You know, there was nothing that science could do on the outside. There was nothing that medicine could do on the outside at that point of time to help her. And that drives me. And you are all you need is my tag word of my programs. I don't take it in a sense of ego. I take it in the sense that if you have self-doubt, address that self-doubt. But you have so much inside you that you do not give yourself credit for. Work through those doubts. 
open up that Pandora's box, that reservoir that lies inside you, you will flow. You'll need help. We all need help, but we all have it within ourselves. So I always say you are all you need. You take a crutch, you take a stick for as long as it is needed to go past the wobbly stage. But buddy, you'll have to walk and run on your own and you have it in you to do that. Mwani, thank you so much for helping us to the whole genesis of celebrating moment and thus celebrating life. Appreciate you taking time and sharing those wonderful words of wisdom with me and with all of our listeners out here. Thank you, Shrikant. I wouldn't call them words of wisdom. I just call them words of my self-conviction. That's all. Somebody else's reality might be different. I am just tuned into this for myself. It works well for me. And I hope if it resonates with somebody else, they look at it a little bit differently. That's all. Thank you so much for having me. That's a wrap, folks. Thank you for listening. And if you like this episode and feel someone can benefit, please do share it. If you have any feedback or comment, you can leave a voice message which is there in the show notes below. Drop me a quick note at inspiresomeonetodaypodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, stay well and keep inspiring. Thank you for listening into today's edition of Inspire Someone Today. It's been a privilege to bring in these conversations. If you like this episode and have any feedback or comments, do mail me at Inspire someone today podcast at the rate gmail.com. Inspiring someone is like creating ripples around us. If you like what to listen, feel free to share them and let's create ripples of inspiration. Do not forget to follow me on my Instagram handle at the rate Inspire someone today podcast for all the latest updates. This is Srikant, your host, signing off, and until next time, keep inspiring.